In this episode, it's time for some layout updates, so we head out to the GN in 1970. Well, what do you want me to say? I just wandered in here? We cover the installation of a number of backgrounds, as well as the techniques it takes to take this tangent car to this level of detail. That can't be a model. We look at the Empire Builder and find time to run a few trains. So kick back, roll an axle, and maybe you'll accidentally learn something on this episode of the GN 1970. 70. I took that series of photos back in 2005. I finally stitched them together in Photoshop, got them printed, I don't know, probably around 2018. Fellow modeler David Thompson printed these out. They're 11 feet in length, two feet in height, and well, it's quite sizable, but gives a nice impression as far as the background is concerned, because this is on our railroad, just outside of Litchfield. How fitting, right? Well, we were happy with how they turned out, so we ended up contacting Dave to print another one. The material that he prints it on is around an 80 pound cover stock, which is nice, it's flexible enough, but it's stiff enough to stay upright. I do put just a little bit of double stick tape along the very top edge to stop it from falling down. But other than that, it's kind of snugly fit into place. I don't think snugly's a word. Nonetheless, we're happy on the east end of Wilmer to have this background in place and looking good. Attempting to weather the prototype. Taking a moment to weather a 4180 air slide by tangent scale models and HO scale. We're looking at the prototype to get an idea of what kind of weathering techniques we're going to use to be able to create this look. Well, if you layer enough, you can get a nice look on a car, but where do you start? First, you got to have the blank canvas. I do start with a Tamiya wash with a wider synthetic brush. The wider brush is better than the one that comes with it because this thing, it would take us a while to use if we end up using that on the car. So lay down the wash across the entire car, noting that any area that you leave a little bit thicker wash is gonna leave a little bit of that blemish that looks like it is on the prototype. I do use a hair dryer to dry the car. It helps speed up the process, but you don't always have to. You can walk away or integrate other techniques like we did with the colored pencil. I am using mineral spirits here to clean off the high spots on the rib. If you do look to the prototype, the prototype you'll notice that the high spots on each of the ribs are a little bit lighter. So I go along with a Q-tip, clean those off. After I've completed that process, I move on to chalking the car with Doc O'Brien's weathering powders. I use grungy gray with a soft bristled brush. I work between the ribs and don't try to get it all over the ribs, but create these kind of dark areas on the lower half of the car. We're going to come in afterwards once you've created that kind of look and add this to me a tape. Andy Dorsch, a fellow modeler, suggested this stuff for custom painting. Well, I'm using it for custom chalking. As you can see, I lay the tape down. It actually lifts some of that chalk that we had previously applied, but I also will put the tape down and then add a little chalk, and then when it's removed, it'll leave a line, kind of given that reference, that zigzag pattern that is developed on the side of a lot of air slides or freight cars. This is the technique I use. I think it works fairly well. It's subtle, it's not over the top, and it gets the point across. I do use the AK Interactive colored pencils, and in this application, I'm not using it for uh, adding washes to. I'm just adding areas where either a patch was done, there might have been um, information on the car you want to black out. You can just use the colored pencil, and it takes care of it for you. The last step I take is adding the decals. I end up using a micro brush to clean off the area where I'm going to apply a decal. I do use Solvaset to be able to set the decals. The two that I'm going to be adding are lube plates and an ACI plate. I do these last because the railroad actually added these on later in the car's career, so they do look a little cleaner or newer. So that's the reason I uh, end up going this route. I do use the AK pencil just to nick up a couple more areas. But that's it as far as the car side is concerned. That blotchy look that you're shooting for the prototype, those are the effects that I use to be able to try to achieve that look. We'll address the roof in just a little bit. Oh, not more roof weathering. The CBQ already had 50 of these, but the other 50 air slide cars of the 4180 cubic capacity classed LO6B and numbered 87750 to 87799. Externally, they had somewhat different vertical end bracing, consequently different handbrake mounting arrangements as well. They were also the only Q air slides with the registered trademark stenciled on the cars in the upper left-hand corner. What year did the Burlington receive this car series? Was it A, 62, photo in 78, B, 64, photo in 82, C, 65, photo in 77, or is it D, 66, and the photos in 1980? We'll find out later in this episode. Well, the elephant in the room, the good old helix. Friends don't let friends build helixes. 
we didn't have much of a choice to get to the second deck, and we didn't have any friends telling us otherwise. So we ended up printing out this background to help wrap around the helix. Again, 24 inches high, and I think it's about 15 feet in length. Nonetheless, this shot was taken here locally in the Twin Cities, just a tree line with the swamp. Now the camera tipped a little bit before I realized I was recording more ceiling than the actual install process, but you get the general idea. We're trying to wrap the helix with the background just to give it a little bit better look. All in all, we were pleased with how it turned out. It was better than the big blue wall. You want to also note that the photos that I took were taken in early summer, late spring, which is kind of when the merger took place. At the end of the day, we were pretty happy. And we didn't stop there. We moved on to the Superior Line, which is just above YZ. Not geographically in real life, but on a railroad, this is the way it worked out. So I took a little extra hunk that we had and worked it into this place. Now note the very top edge. We didn't use one that had sky because this was more than two feet high, but I did use a Fisker's deckled edge. This is a craft scissors that my mom had on hand, and I ended up cutting along the very top edge to be able to give ourselves a little bit more of a natural edge. As you can see here, just work in another tree, and we get ourselves in a position that we're calling her good enough. It's better than this. We started out here open space. It's kind of the great wide open and having ourselves that little bit of swamp. My dad added some of the uh, tall pre-manufactured grass kind of integrate in with the swamp, but it's just a little bit better than what was there. And the last area we upgraded the background of was alongside our interchange tracks. This used to just be a blue painted brick wall. I think this is an improvement. We'll let you take a look at a few of the trains getting put back into position. Here's a 10 second tip. Could paint markers be any more handy? This is a great way to weather wheel sides as well as truck frames. Very simple, very easy, and makes your rolling stock look a hundred times better. At least 10 times better. You can always learn a little. By looking at the real deal. Here we are at North Town Yard, just checking out some of the diamonds in the rough. Here's number 2815, it's a GP39M. The BNSF paint applied probably around 2012. This is the newer scheme. It was previously in BN paint, number 2815, with a white face, and it did rock the original black and cascade green BN scheme, and of course, the Omaha orange and Pullman green. Here at North Town Yard was a former NP yard. Now here's a shot by Marty Bernard that was caught in 1964, early in its life. But how cool is it to see it late in its life, 50 plus years later, back in Minneapolis, rocking its original look. Obviously the internals are different, but it's still cool to see. I know we've covered a number of rough weathering techniques, but this is a very simple one using Tamiya's light brown accent wash, a wide synthetic brush, and just apply it across the entire car a little AK interactive chipping brown colored pencil along the edge, but other than that, it's a very straightforward process. You could do this roof in probably a minute and a half, two minutes. Uh, as you can see here, we'll use the hair dryer to dry it a little bit quicker, come in with the AK interactive chipping colored pencil, and the roof itself for the most part then here is done. I can't stress it enough to look to the prototype for the grit, the grime, and the textures that a car has to be able to take a out of the box tangent car Add a little bit of that flavor to give it the look of a worn car. You don't want to go over the top, so layering is always best, but it always is best to look to the prototype. I'm going to let you guys look at the before and afters and enjoy a few prototype photos as well. Enjoy. Well, I hope you enjoyed that before and after. It felt like this model came out outstanding. I was very happy with the techniques that I ended up using. You saw how I did it. The way you get here is repetition. So keep practicing. 
Well, the answer to when these cars were built and photographed was D, 1966, photo in 1980. Though not visible, these cars were divided internally into two separate compartments. That's a weird fact. Well, it was a weird question. Modeler highlights with Aki Unahara, the Empire Builder. Here's something you won't see very often on the GN in 1970, a P5A box cab electric. This is Pennsylvania number 4774, which is a Broadway limited unit with Paragon 3 sound. It does have three CB and Q cars in tow, which is probably about as inaccurate as you can get, but it doesn't have electric wires above it either and we're motoring along. You'll notice also in the foreground there's an Empire Builder. Well, that train itself, it's probably not all that accurate when you're comparing it to the Mr. Empire Builder himself, Aki Unahara. This is his railroad. Talk about an empire. He's got this thing all set up. It is in DC, so it does not have DCC capabilities, but you don't need it when you're having this much fun. One thing to note about these passenger trains is they are prototypically accurate. Aki really keys in on trying to get the right cars, the right consists, facing the right direction, and if he can't find them, he kit bashes them. Yes, that means cutting into a Broadway Limited car to make it right. Here we spin around and take a look the other direction on the railroad. As you can see, there's a lot of track going on here. He has eight power packs hooked up to be able to run on any number of different routes, but when it really is all said and done, impressive is a word that describes it best. We're going to swing into staging to take a look at where trains can come and go. Here we have a Pensy 442 rolling in. I don't know what particular train this is, but clearly it's got some heavyweight cars on it, so I know just enough about the passenger world to be dangerous. Oh, you're dangerous, all right. As you can see, there are a number of tracks that are open, so he has a lot of trains that can come and go. Let's step back into the railroad room and watch a few trains running. Hey, over here. Take my picture. Not a steam guy, but it is cool to see a lot of the different stuff running. The sound isn't synced up exactly to the chuff of the steam engine because, well, I'm not a steam guy. And Aki's not a sound guy. So, we make the two worlds collide. And not even that accurately. Alright, how could we coin this segment the Empire Builder and not have the Empire Builder? Now I know nothing about the exact schemes of the passenger world, but I do know this is before 1970. It's actually before 1965. I think I'm even safe to say it's before 1963. That's just a guess. But this is the Minneapolis Depot that he's got here. He's worked in obviously a few more passenger trains. Seeing all the stuff that Aki has created and the Empire that he is building, it is very cool. We had the opportunity of meeting Aki a few years ago via fellow modeler Dave. Hi Dave! We were glad that we did because this guy is an extremely knowledgeable passenger guy, but he also resists freight just a little bit. Normally you will not see this on his railroad, but we do have a freight train here thanks to fellow modeler Todd for bringing this in because you normally would not see this on Aki's railroad. Being a passenger guy and as accurate as he is, this is probably the most modern equipment you'll ever see on his railroad, well, ever. A slight tangent I do have to go on is these reflective stripes that Todd put onto his freight cars. It gave such a cool effect because he actually used actual reflective material. And as you can see here, little night photography and you get yourself kind of a cool effect.
And as the Empire Builder passes this modern freight, it's something that we'd normally have never seen in real life. But one thing is to be said about what we've got going on here, fellow modelers running trains and just having a good time. As Todd runs that one and only freight train on Aki's Railroad, a huge thanks to Aki for having us out to be able to run trains and being just a class act and a nice guy. So when it comes down to it, we're going to let Aki take us out with his take on Todd's train. I never thought of any freight train running under those tracks. Remember to please like, tag, share, and follow, as well as subscribe to the YouTube channel. And if you'd like to see the hobby grow, a simple click goes a long way. Thanks for watching. You done shoot about as good as you model. Here's Colin coming at you to answer the question of the week. I don't sing. I don't follow Kenny Rogers. But I do follow Johnny Cash. I hear the train coming. Here it's rolling around the bend. And I ain't, so why wouldn't I listen to anything but Johnny Cash? Because he's a train man. And that's Colin answering your question of the week. Hopefully you enjoyed the content of this episode. If you want to see more, you can check out more episodes of the GN in 1970, as well as Sue the Milwaukee Road. You can see a tour of the GN in 1970 and even a few other layout tours. Nonetheless, check out the content and hopefully you enjoy that, as well as future episodes. Thanks for watching. <laughs>